Welcome to another episode of Showcase, Tierra 2 World's daily arts and culture show coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. From the highway to going on display, later in the program, we'll visit an exhibition in Los Angeles that drives home the concept of artsy cars and speak to a film critic about director Steve McQueen's socially progressive heist movie, Widows. But first... Scandinavia's cinematic future. We'll show you how the Stockholm International Film Festival is shaping Sweden's film culture. Turning a page of history, Leonardo da Vinci's Codex Lester goes on display in Florence. Aside from his artistic talents, Leonardo da Vinci was also a gifted inventor, architect, engineer, and astute observer of both earthly nature as well as astronomy. And now, 500 years after his death, Italy is paying homage to the Renaissance master with a series of events, beginning with an exhibition of one of his most famous manuscripts. The medieval city of Florence is mainly known for its impressive Duomo, the architectural masterpiece of Ponte Vecchio, and the genius of Leonardo da Vinci. The Uffizi Gallery, home to the finest collection of Italian paintings, is honoring the Renaissance master by displaying his Codex Lester, or Lester Code, one of the most important and valuable manuscripts in the world. And it became one of the most expensive books of all time when Bill Gates bought it for around $30 million back in 1994. The Codex Lester is a 72-page manuscript composed of just 18 sheets of paper each of them folded in half and written on both sides. And its main topic is water. It is, of course, the complex form of water, not just the water one can see flowing in a river. It's the movement of water, its cohesion, the pressure it creates on containers, its molecular structure, the reflection of light on the surface of the water, moving or still, the waves, the whirlpools, it's a 360-degree complexity. The ancient manuscript also investigates the luminosity and material nature of the moon, the history of the Earth, and its transformations. The Codex Lester is an extraordinary uh, document as to Leonardo's scientific and engineering research. The primary subject is water, and in fact, um, in his um, you know, thoughts about uh, water, uh, he's extremely modern. In fact, he uh, touches subjects which right now are again um, on the minds of astrophysicists, uh, uh, the question of the origin of water. Leonardo hypothesized that there would be water on the moon based on his observation. Visitors have a chance to decipher da Vinci's original Italian text written in his signature style, from right to left, using digital screens, while the original codex sheets are displayed in showcases. Among the notes it reads, Make eyeglasses to see the moon larger. An interesting instruction considering the first known record of a telescope would come more than a century later. Leonardo's manuscripts, with the exception of the Codex Lester, were rediscovered at the end of the 18th century. After the rediscovery, when science had considerably progressed, we rediscovered this huge legacy, belonging to this extraordinarily brilliant man who had foreseen not only how the scientific method works, but also in which direction research would have actually evolved. Water as Microscope of Nature, Leonardo da Vinci's Codex Lester, runs at the Uffizi Gallery until the 20th of January. It's not that common for a movie festival to play a leading role in a country's national cinematic identity. But that's exactly the case when it comes to the Stockholm International Film Festival. 
Since its early days, the event has not only featured the best cinema the country has to offer, but it's also provided support to the filmmaking community through its scholarships and prizes. For more than two decades, the festival set in the Swedish capital has been a breeding ground for homegrown talent, including Thomas Alfredsson, arguably the most famous director, to come out from Northern Europe in the last 20 years, as well as Oscar-winning actor Alicia Vikander. Both played pivotal roles in putting their country on the international culture map. In addition to that, each year the organizers of the festival also invite some of the most high-profile directors working in the global arena, providing Swedish cinephiles with the ideal film forum. To get more information on the Stockholm Film Festival, let's speak to the director and co-founder of the festival, Git Shanius. Thank you so much for being with us today, Git. Now, as we said, you are the director and the co-founder. What motivated you to start this festival? Well, there wasn't any film festival in Stockholm, and I started my career as a culture journalist and went around the international film festival and was uh, driven by the case that it was very few interesting projects on the cinema theater in Stockholm and in Sweden. So together with some friends, we decided to start a new international film festival in Stockholm. And so it went. Now, um, this seems to be a very director-driven festival. Um, would you describe that as the main highlight of the overall festival itself, having so many directors there? Well, we are a very um, directors-driven festival, which means that we put a lot of money into bringing the director to, to Stockholm. Also, of course, the actors and the producer. But director is very important for us because they are the soul behind the, the film. And, uh, of course, in, in, in a frame of 29 years, uh, there is a lot of good moments, but... Uh, if you mention a few of the directors who've been here, I'm very proud to uh, be able to welcome Von Kai Wai. <clears throat> uh, he's the director in the Mood for Love, and he doesn't go very often to international film festivals. So before going to Stockholm, he's only been to Cannes. And uh, the film and uh, Von Kai Wai was so warm welcome here to Sweden. So that was a very nice moment for us all, for film lovers, for journalists, and the Film Society of Sweden. What exactly makes the Stockholm Film Festival so different from all the other international festivals around the world? Uh, I, I think um, uh, beside the fact that we are very direct, uh, directors driven and we bring a lot of directors to the festival, we also have one of the world's biggest uh, cash prize. Uh, that consists of one million Swedish crowns, and uh, it calls the Impact Prize. And uh, besides the money, it's also a statuette uh, with the world famous um, artist uh, um, Ai Weiwei, who was made for us. Why did Iranian director Asghar Farhadi win the Stockholm Visionary Award? What Faradi did with a separation, he won the first Oscar ever uh, for Iran movies and he has uh, uh, a lot of quality that we would like to shed more lights on and discuss the production um, uh, qualities of Iran film. So we are very, very proud and very impressed of having Asghar Faradi here with his latest film, uh, who called Everybody Knows, that screened Penelope Cruz and Javier Bardem in the, in the main cast. Good. Thank you so much for giving us that insight on the Stockholm Film Festival. Thank you. Have a good time. Still to come on Showcase, the art behind custom cars. The heat is on as we kick it into high gear and head to LA to look at the never-ending hot rod phenomenon. Our husbands aren't coming back. We're on our own. But they're not alone. We take a look at this year's second star-studded and all-female-led heist movie. But first, let's take a look at a few other stories about culture and the arts making headlines. 
Contemporary artist Ben Enwanwu's portrait of a Nigerian princess titled Tutu is on display to the public for the first time in Lagos, Nigeria, where it was originally created. Dubbed the African Mona Lisa, the painting considered a national treasure was lost for more than 40 years and was just rediscovered in London last year. It sold in February for more than $1.5 million, setting a record for Ben Enwanwu. To understand where is the, the face. Yes. In Lebanon, the National Museum has started a program that allows blind and visually impaired visitors to touch and feel the artifacts on display. Doors Please Touch was launched by Lebanese NGO Red Oak in collaboration with Italy's Omero Tactile Museum, one of the few museums in the world where touching the objects in its collection is allowed. Currently, the project is only one of its kind in Lebanon, but the plan is to launch the program at other institutions in Beirut. Anonymous graffiti artist and prankster Banksy has created a replica of an Israeli separation wall in the West Bank for London's World Travel Fair. The replica is hoping to promote tourism to Palestine and brings attention to another one of his creations called the Walled Off Hotel. The installation is built along the West Bank and described by the artist as the hotel with the worst view ever because in every room you see the wall. Movies led by women and movies with ethnically diverse lead characters don't pull the crowds unless they're romantic comedies. Filmmakers often confess to hearing this sentiment made by studio executives with a narrow-minded point of view. But thankfully, Oscar-winning director Steve McQueen proves this kind of thinking wrong with Widows. Earlier this year, Warner Brothers Ocean's 8 turned the robbery film on its head by anchoring its story around a criminal gang made up of women. And this breaking of stereotypes received positive reactions from fans of the genre. Our husbands aren't coming back. Now, a similar feature has gone one step ahead by introducing a racially diverse female cast. Caribbean British director Steve McQueen's latest movie looks at a group of mourning widows who vow to complete a heist initiated by their late spouses. African-America actor Viola Davis, who plays the brains behind the plan, says the project allowed her to finally channel a three-dimensional character in every sense of the word. I thought it was a gift that it came to me. I always say if I turned this role down, it probably would have gone to a Caucasian actress. Um, it really was a gift to be able to play a woman that is tough, who is strong, is take control, but she's also very much a woman, vulnerable, sensitive, sexualized in a way. Um, so, yeah, loved it. This is for guns. Guns. And the Oscar-winning Caribbean British director of Widows has nothing but praise for his cast. If this whole thing goes wrong, I want my kids to know that I didn't just sit there and take it. She's iconic. I mean, she's like Greta Garbo. She's like uh, Betty Davis. She's like, uh, uh, you know, Catherine Hepburn. You know, when people use this, and people are saying about this picture, oh, great, they're making movies with female leads. In the 30s, 40s, and 50s, they used to do it all the time. These were icons. They were film. They were stars who were icons. Why aren't they doing it anymore? I don't know. But I was very grateful that I met Viola, who is that kind of level of actress. Now, the best thing we have going for us is being who we are. Media outlets have given actors' performances the two thumbs up, saying we may remember these widows for a long while yet. Another person who has given Steve McQueen's widows a two thumbs up is filmmaker, writer and critic Rajesh Thind, who joins me now from our studios in London. Thank you so much for being with us today, Rajesh. Now, in your review, you Good say reading. that Widows really and directly speaks to the Me Too movement. In what ways does it do that? Well, you know, here we've got a film that really takes the genre heist film, the crime caper, which is always sort of, you know, traditionally very much a male genre. Um, you know, the women are, are the gangsters moles or they're the sort of, you know, sort of they're always discarded and left behind while the men go about doing sort of the business, you know, whether it's robbing a bank or a high-end house. In this film, 
what we have is the tables are turned. You know, at the very beginning of the film, Viola Davis's husband, played by Liam Neeson, who's a high-end sort of you know robber baron, um, you know one of the sort of top sort of robbers of his of his uh, of the Chicago scene where they're based. Um, he and his male, very male crew, um, set off for a, a big job and and uh, and die. And, uh, and at the end of it, what happens is, is that uh, Viola Davis, as Liam Neeson's sort of uh, widowed wife, is left with, uh, uh, you know, she's ma it's made very clear to her by uh, a sort of gangster who wants to be a politician that the two million dollars that was on the line in, in Liam Neeson's heist is now down to her. So, you know, Viola Davis, uh, for the Vanessa character, sets about getting together all the widows of all of the gang that have died and saying, you know, let's, let's do this. You know, there's a great line in the film where they say, she says, you know, the reason we might be able to get away with this is because nobody expects us to, has to have the balls to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's really turning the whole sort of macho genre scene on its head. And then there's lots more as well. I mean, that's just the beginning. Really. That is just I mean, the beginning. The film. It's, it's another case of where <laughs> yeah, women uh, step in to save the day, let's say. Um, now, you know, movies either make it or break it for directors. Um, do you think that with Widows, Steve McQueen is, you know, stepping up the ladder of the cinematic, in the cinematic industry? I mean, I think Steve McQueen is a remarkable filmmaker and artist. I mean, let's not forget that he started his career as a Turner Prize women, winning video artist, came out of, you know, art school, then made the transfer into film. I mean, whether it's a, a, a leap up, I mean, the man has, he's one of the few people to have both a Turner Prize and an Oscar for 12 Years a Slave. So rather than a step up, perhaps, I'd say it's almost as if Steve McQueen is now deciding to play and it's a stepping out. He, he, he's, he's sort of very deliberately going into very populist, very mainstream appeal types of films, such as Widows, The Crime Caper, and he's making them his own. I mean, I saw it, you know, he, he's been speaking recently on his tour around for Widows. He's been saying that, you know, he, he, he'd like to make a musical next. You know, he, he, he's very much somebody who I think doesn't feel trapped or limited by what he's supposed to do. And I think that's one of his great sort of strengths as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. I want to take a moment to talk about the effect that Gillian Flynn has ha had on this movie. She's clearly an amazing yeah. author uh, that has some amazing, amazing books, uh, Gone Girl being one of them, best-selling, as we all know. Um, how do we see her twist throughout the movie? I mean, again, it comes back to your first question, Efan, in, in that... You know, Gillian is on record as saying that she is bored of sort of, uh, you know, the typical women roles that people think are strong women, the sort of brave rape survivor or the uh, introspective fashionista. You know, she says, why can't women be bad? Why can't they be selfish? Why can't they be violent? You know, why can't they, why do they have to be either perfect or superfluous? And I think in that way, you see these characters are very much sort of Gillian Flynn characters. And also there's all the touches in the film in the same way that with Gone Girl, which she wrote both the novel and the script, um, there's as much as there's the darkness and there are all the sort of thriller elements, there's also this sort of slightly cheeky humour that comes through, even in the darkest moments. I mean, in Widows, it plays, you know, the, uh, Viola Davis's character, quite amusingly, sort of... Uh, carries around her little white dog, who reminded me of the sort of dog in the Tintin cartoons. And she's sort of, you know, forever carrying around this dog as if it's a sort of surrogate child. And there's just something wonderfully sort of dark and humorous about it. And there's something wonderfully um, dark and humorous about the characters too. These are not women trying to please anybody. These are not anybody's idea of good women. And I think Gillian Flynn is sort of very deliberately rejecting that notion of, you know, that women need to be good. They can also be bad. And we can still, you know, in this age of anti-heroes, we can still really appreciate, you know, a good, bad woman. And I think that's a, that's a great thing. You know, I think, I, you know, several writers have written about how, you know, they hope this heralds the return to mm -hmm. good, you know, evil women characters who are really strong and who we still vouch for. You know, there are so many anti-heroes now. You could say that in many ways in the film we live in an age where the anti-hero is, is prime. Now, Regis, uh, let's talk a bit about the cast. Uh, Viola Davis, obviously, you've spoken about her on, 
in several uh, times throughout this interview. Uh, yeah. Liam Neeson, what I mean, do you she's think? She's amazing. Just to say, she's fantastic. Um, Liam Neeson has, uh, you know, Liam Neeson's a great actor, and, and it's great to see him play a bit part, frankly, and he does it very well. Um, I mean, some of the other male characters as well, so, you know, Colin Farrell plays a, a, a sort of a conflicted political heir who's sort of taking over his father, Robert Duvall's congressional uh, district in Chicago. Um, and, you know, he sort of doesn't quite know whether he wants the job. And his father, Robert Duvall, again, a sort of supporting role, but is just one of the most wonderfully sort of racist characters you'll ever see on screen. He's just so sort of unapologetically sort of reactionary. And I think that's also, you know, something that this film really shines with. It doesn't step away from... Uh, you know, really tough stuff, but it, it, it presents it in a way that's really uh, engaging. You know. Rajesh, I'm going to have to end up there, but thank you so much for joining us today on Showcase. Thank you very much. While movies like the Fast and Furious film franchise made many a moviegoer want to run out and buy a customized car, souped-up motors have been around for a long time. In fact, mechanics-turned-artists have been what some have called Frankensteining cars since the early 1960s. Artfully merging man and machine, this subculture has become an industry unto itself. And a new exhibition in Los Angeles is allowing drivers and admirers to get behind the wheel. For anyone who thinks cars are not pieces of art, be prepared to swallow those doubts as a new exhibition speeds your way. Autodidactic, the juxtaposed school exhibit, is taking place at the world-renowned Peterson Automotive Museum to mark their 25th anniversary and is delving into the culture of customization. So visitors get to see how these, let's face it, mostly boys, artfully modify their toys. This exhibit is a compendium of art uh, be it sculpture, painting, automotive art, modified automobiles, and it kind of examines the interrelationship of art culture and commentary between the two as, as propelled by a motorized mechanized transport. Is that you in that beautiful car? Jeez, what a waste of machinery. Starting in 1960s in South California, classic American cars were reimagined and remolded in a sense for greater performance, and soon became known as hot rods. They quickly became part of youth culture, one that was perfectly captured in the film American Graffiti. And while the movement may have started with cars, it did not stop there. Custom culture, which is this sort of definitively Southern California phenomenon, takes everyday uh, utilitarian objects like cars um, and influences them with an edgier, art-inspired look. Um, this isn't just about cars, really. It spreads into the worlds of skateboarding, surfing, uh, comic strips. Uh, all these things come together to form this really vibrant, eclectic, colorful landscape of, of really it's sort of visual entertainment. The exhibition is also celebrating 25 years of the art and culture magazine Juxtapose. Created in 1994 after their exhibition named Custom Culture, the magazine has played a large part in driving the phenomenon into the mainstream. Custom culture really brings forward this sort of new energy. It's sort of like an edgy outsider art that really challenges mainstream culture. So you see it in really vibrant colors, sort of psychedelic themes. Uh, you've got Rat Fink, who is sort of this anti-Mickey Mouse. He's got bloodshot eyes and he looks really edgy. It's really sort of that movement that takes you away from uh, what most people would consider sort of the center, off to the edge. With showstoppers at the exhibition, like this 1932 Ford Roaster, widely considered as the first hot rod. Or this Cadillac from 1959, which has turned into a disco on wheels. The exhibition unifies and explores where that connection has led this last quarter of a century. With other hot rod exhibitions taking place around the world, the culture is steadily speeding ahead. 
And that wraps up another episode of Showcase, but don't forget you can always visit our YouTube channel to watch more of our coverage of the global art scene. From me, Efnan Han, and the rest of the Showcase team, thanks for watching. See you next time.